Cranberry Growers Association, <clears throat> which I learned is a very old, one of the oldest farming uh, associations across the country. It's from the 1800s. 18, See, I did 1888. My own work. <laughs> and Deb has been a tour guide with the association for many years. And today she's going to tell us about the native cranberry, the history of the native cranberry, its health benefits, and she's got a lot of recipes and samples for us. Mm -hmm. So please help me welcome Deb. And she's got some pals. Yes. <laughs> I've got uh, Christine with me and Pam, and they both work on the Cranberry Bog Tours with me, so um, they're here to help me out, especially when I get stuck on something, especially something garden-ish, so maybe <laughs> they can help me. But what a great organization you have. My God, I'm just, and this is a great time of year to be gardeners because all this great stuff that's coming up um, with all the fairs and I see that sign up thing going around and your captive audience, you know, and she, she's not going to let you out of here until everybody signs up. Um, and uh, so the cran cranberry, uh, how many, first let me ask, how many of you ever been to a cranberry harvest? Oh, well I can go home then. <laughs> That's great. Um, anybody live near a bog? Look at that too. Fantastic. Okay, I live on a bog and uh, been there for about seven years and um, my late husband and I used to go out on that bog all, all season. Um, he, he camped out in a tent in the winter time once out on the bog. Uh, came running home when the coyotes were making some noise. Um, but it, it's the it's absolutely beautiful place to live near. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to hike and walk around some of the bogs that you see. Um, now the cranberry is uh, the state berry in Massachusetts. Um, it's part of the fabric of this commonwealth. Uh, it's the state color and cranberry juice cocktail is the state drink. I prefer the cranberry mojito, but they haven't changed it yet. Um, and uh, I would like the cardinal to be the state bird because he's red, but uh, unfortunately it's a chickadee, and I, I like that little bird too. Uh, before I forget, we have recipes here besides some uh, dried, uh, dried cranberries, and there are other recipes if you go to cranberries.org, which is the Cranberry Growers Association's um, website. So they have a lot more recipes. I've tried quite a few things and they're really scrumptious and they're good, good. for you. All right, so um, we, um, we talked a little bit about the Cranberry Growers Association. Uh, we have several uh, tour guides. We started that up about three or four years ago. Um, we also do a lot of tours out of AD Makepeace Farms uh, on Tahonet Road in Wareham. Um, and if you have not been to Make Peace Farms, they're still open until about Thanksgiving. And they have a new museum right next to their uh, little shop where they sell a lot of food and, and cranberry products. And that museum is absolutely beautiful. And they have a wonderful mural that goes around the whole thing showing all the four seasons of the cranberry. So I encourage you to go down to Make Peace Farms and take a look at that before they close for the season or next year. Um, so the Growers Association has set the, the, uh, the uh, barrel size and, and years and years ago the barrel was, you know, cranberries were put in a barrel and that's why they called a barrel. But the barrel actually is 100 pounds of cranberries today. Um, it's the oldest um, farming organization in the country as was mentioned and it represents all of the growers in Massachusetts. And uh, they work to ensure that the cranberry farming remains sustainable throughout the state. And it's really our largest agricultural uh, product, product. And we're not really known as an agricultural state, not like Iowa or Nebraska, you know, with corn and soybeans and everything. So uh, the cranberry uh, growers are really important to this state. The next slide. Okay, so. Um, here is, here's the technical data that you all will love as gardeners. Um, it's the American cranberry. Um, it's, uh, 
there's a European cranberry, but it's uh, not, it's similar, but it doesn't have much taste. Um, it's a wetland plant, even though if you go by a bog and you've gone to a harvest, you'll see moats around the cranberry bogs full of water. And a lot of people think that the cranberries are in water all the time, but they're not. Um, most perennials don't want to be in water all the time. There are two times a year that the cranberry is, is um, flooded or in water, and I'll talk about those a little bit later. Um, it's one of three native fruits, and I bet you can all tell me what the other two are. What? I heard. Well, every, uh, Concord grape is one. Blueberry. Oh. Yeah. Yep, they're the, the three native fruits to Massachusetts. What about beach plums? Uh, are they a f they're fruit? They probably are. Yeah. Did they orig originate somewhere else? I don't know. So maybe that's one of four native fruits. I'll try to research that. Um, they grow on low-lying beds, um, uh, layered with sand, peat, gravel, and clay is the bottom layer. And we can um, move on to the next uh, slide. Okay. Here's the section, um, you know, cranberry, and they're a rubbery plant. A lot of people think when they go out to the bog and they see um, the cranberry being harvested, they think that the vines are going to get broken. But they're very rubbery and steady, and they, they really, uh, when they pop the vines off, they really do um, uh, the berries off, they really work. So you've got the sand, the peat, the gravel, and the clay. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the things that happened, what happened years ago with that soil. Next one. Okay, well, the indigenous people, now I'm, I'm a Mayflower descendant, so I did a lot of studying about um, the early settlers that were here from 1620 on. And, uh, and how they worked with the indigenous people, with the Wampanoags and other tribes. And um, you can see that uh, the cranberries, uh, they made something called pemmican. And today it's very similar to what we would call an energy bar. And I can give you a recipe for pemmican if you'd like to make it. There's four cups of lean, Deer, beef, caribou, or moose. <laughs> Rabbit, if that's all you can find. Three cups of dried cranberries. And two cups of uh, rendered fat or suet. Yum. And then unsalted nuts and about one shot of honey or a maple syrup. And these were all available to the indigenous people. And what they did is they took this pemmican and they put it out in late August, early September, out on a rock, and they, they made patties out of it, and they dried it, and that sustained them through the winter. It's absolutely amazing, and, and that sustained our early settlers uh, from the Mayflower that first winter. It also kept people from getting scurvy. Um, so uh, they also made a poultice for wounds. Uh, anyone here ever been shot by an arrow? <laughs> well, it was quite common back then. So um, th they would uh, put a poultice with cranberry and, um, and water and uh, make a poultice out of it to put it on a wound, uh, and it would help with infection. Um, it was also good for indigestion because uh, the early settlers and also the indigenous people would test out different things in the wild, mushrooms or other things, you know, and sometimes they get a tummy ache. Um, and any kind of swelling um, from maybe insect bites, um, it, blood poisoning, which was very common back then, uh, fevers, seasickness. Indigenous people would call it ibibi, which meant um, bitter berry. And uh, when the settlers got here, they thought, oh, we got to call this another name. So they called it the cranberry. And they did this because the uh, sandhill crane uh, the bud of the plant and the flower looked very similar to the color and the beak on the sandhill crane. Um, so they, you know, they called it the cranberry. Somewhere throughout the ages, that E was gone, and it's called the cranberry today. Next one. Um, before I, I move on to this, the, um, uh, after, um, in the 1800s, the in 1700s, the whaling industry um, whenever the whalers would go out from New Bedford, because the two big industries back then were cod fishing and, and whaling. 
And when the whalers would go out, they would need something to sustain them from, from getting scurvy because they'd be out on the water for six, seven months at a time. And they tried limes because there was a lot of trade with the West Indies back then. Also, you know, sugar cane had come up here too, so it sweetened the berries. But they ended up um, using cranberries. They would fill a couple of barrels with cranberries, and the cranberries would um, sustain them for that time so they wouldn't get scurvy. And once the barrel was empty, they put whale oil in it. So they, you know, they, they were able to really take care of things. Okay, so um, the actual, the first um, harvest of cranberries was done by Captain Henry Hall. And um, before I go into that part of it, the swampy bog origin, and I don't have a piece of bog iron, but the cannonballs were made for the USS Constitution, and they were made in the Federal Furnace in Carver, which is pretty much of all that is gone. Um, and they, um, for the steel industry, you know, developed in the Midwest in the 1800s, there was no more need for this bog iron. So all these crevices were all opened up, and um, they had to find some way to, uh, you know, fill them up with something, and they thought, cranberries. Perfect. So that's why we have so much cranberry, so many cranberry bogs here. And a lot of, on all of our bogs are, you know, kidney shaped and funny shaped. It was all by the way that the bog iron was pulled out. And I think that was, uh, a hematite was the, the actual product that made the bog iron, smelting it down into the cannonballs for the Constitution. Uh, we don't need any cannonballs today, so it's a good thing that we turned these into cranberry bogs. Okay, next one. So, um, our actually, before I, I do this, the, uh, I mentioned ha Captain Henry Hall, who was a Revolutionary War veteran. He lived in Dennis on the Cape, and he had some, some wild cranberries growing on his property, and he was quite near the ocean, and there were dunes near him. And he found that each winter when there were storms, sand would blow from the dunes onto his bogs, and they actually rejuvenated the cranberries. So um, he decided to really transplant everything and make a couple of full bogs, which are still in operation today. And um, the sand was, uh, they're still sanding bogs today during the wintertime, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But what the sanding would do is it would, um, it would kill off any insect larva, it would kill off any weeds, and it also helped the, the stem or the, the, uh, the, um, the stem of the berry to stand more upright because a lot of times out in the bogs it's open land so you would get wind blowing and the berries, you know, the bog, they, would, they would go this way. And, you know, because it is a perennial, that bud is already on there after the, the um, season, just very similar to a rhododendron. So um, he was actually the first harvest of cranberries in the area, and um, he taught other people that had wild cranberries on the Cape uh, and Nantucket to, you know, grow those berries as well. So they were harvesting them all by hand at that time. Next one. Okay, so the seasons of the bog. Very interesting. I actually call it a five-season um, adventure because the, the cranberry growers don't just stop after the, the uh, fall harvest and go to Florida for the rest of the winter. They have a lot of work to do. So you can go to the next one. So winter looks pretty desolate out there. Um, but you'll find that in wintertime, there's constant monitoring of those buds. They have to be very careful. And uh, fall and spring and winter, the growers have to be very careful about the, the plant. And uh, in Boston, it might be 40 degrees at night, but on the bog, it might be 20 degrees or 15 degrees. So um, years past, growers used to sit in their trucks and you know, go out and monitor with local thermometers and temperature meters. And today, it's, it's a lot more um, uh, technically astute. They have actually a um, smartphone that uh, is attached to um, all the different meters around the bog to tell them what the temperature is um, and to make sure that they know 
um, if there might be a frost because if in, in within 20 minutes a bog can be totally gone for the year if they don't save those berries and get them protected with water or with sprinkler systems. Okay, the next one. So the ice sanding, as we talked about with Captain Henry Hall, found that the sanding was good. Every three years, maybe five years, some, some uh, growers actually every other year or so, sand the bogs. Now we'll talk a little bit about climate change here because the seven years that I've been in Plymouth and the bogs that I live on, only one of those years those bogs have been frozen when they flood them. So um, they have to figure out other ways. Of course, then they can put the sand on, and in the spring when the, the, everything thaws, the sand goes right down in, and it's a really easy way to do that. But the bogs aren't freezing up that much. Plus, the kids that go skating on the bog when it is frozen get mad at the growers when they put sand on it because then they can't do their, you know, they can't skate and play hockey. And they're not doing it to discourage the kids. They usually try to hold off a few weeks, especially around school vacation, to let kids get out there and skate. But, um, but the, now the sanding, if, if the bog hasn't frozen, they've got to find another way to sand. So they have machinery that actually um, can throw the sand on from the, or on the side. Uh, they have other machinery with great big fat tires that can go out onto the bog and put the sand in in the like early spring, late winter, uh, where it won't hurt the, the uh, vines. And, um, and then they have you know, several different ways. And they manufacture all their own equipment. There isn't a, like a John Deere or a Honda engine or any of these companies that feel that there's enough business for them to create all these different types of machinery that the growers need. So they buy the engines and they make them themselves. And they've done this since 1947. They've just slowly learned how to, to you know, make the ice machines, to make the harvesting machines, and anything else that they might need while they're, while they're on the bog. Okay, next one. And the springtime. This is also a very tricky time because I remember last year, this, this past year, in June 15th we had a frost on the bog. So. And it's funny, when I got up this morning and it was cold, I saw on the TV that um, it has not been this cold since March 28th or something this, this year. So um, I'm sure even in March they had to watch that bud out there on the, on the, um, on the vines. So uh, frost protection, they have their sprinkler systems, which are automatic, um, certainly saves a lot of water. and. Um, they, uh, you know, once uh, something, the bud is encapsulated, it creates a heat source, so that protects the bud. And then when the sun comes out and the day warms up, that all just, you know, comes off, but they might have to do thing the, some, the same thing the next night as well. Next one. And then in spring also, the vine starts to elongate, so it's going to be sticking up a little bit more and even more vulnerable. Okay, next one. Spring sanding. Oh, yeah. Well, the spring sanding it can be winter or spring. You can see the little machineries that they have. What? Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Um, but you know, they have the big fat tires. They can get out on the bog, and then they have a, a something that you know looks almost like a pontoon boat for a party boat, and go out and spread sand off the back. So when you're around a bog, you always see a great big pile of sand off to the side, and that's, that's why they keep it. Okay, next one. And renovation. That happens in the spring. And what uh, some of these bogs that we have, uh, the plants in them are over 100 years old. And they do a good job, but they stop producing as much over time. And also... Uh, the bugs and things that are out there get very acclimated to them and know how to attack them a little bit better than the newer plants. So um, some of the growers, or you know, growers at different times will renovate a bog, and what they will do is they will just shave off everything. They will put new sand in. They will laser level it. It will also be higher, so it needs less water. Um, in the summer, if it's a drought time, or in the in the winter when they flood the bog, and um, that would also help them um, 
you know, put new plants in, whether they put a hybrid plant in or they put a, uh, uh, cuttings and clippings from their, their regular plants and they use plugs and those plugs are made by a machine and then another one comes by with people on the back that drop the plants into those plugs. And um, it takes, uh, they, they'll get a harvest the next year, but it won't be very great. And then two, three, maybe four years. And it can cost anywhere from 5000 to 50000 upwards to 100000 to actually redo a bog. But a lot of the, the hybrid plants will produce more, bigger berries, um, and it, you know, it helps the growers. Okay. So these are some of the replanting machines. As I mentioned, they make the plugs over here and come by with the people in the back. All got these nice hats on, protect from the sun, and they're dropping the things in the plug. And then here, they're, um, they're actually cleaning off the bogs and um, replanting as well. But sometimes they'll actually retool the entire bog and make it more rectangular so it's easier for their harvesting machines to come in. Okay. Yep. So I mentioned the, the benefits are leveling the bogs, improving irrigation. They put new irrigation systems in, sprinklers similar to you have in your, your home. It uses less water. It decreases those pests because it takes three, four, five, six years for pests to start to figure out, you know, what they can come after. And it increases the yield and the production. And the irrigation improvements over time. They have the soil moisture, moisture probes, the tensometers, water level floats, um, pop-up sprinkler heads. We work with a grower in Carver that talks about a system that he has for his sprinkler systems where um, he might turn one off in 15 minutes and another one on, another one off and on, and uses even less water than a lot of the other growers might use. Next one. And now summertime, and now we got the cranberry. <laughs> so we've got the flowers come out, and it's changing a color on the bog too because it's going from a deep burgundy color, the leaves, to a green. It's really pretty. When you, know, you can walk around that bog, and every season you'll see a different color, the leaves. So now you've got the buds there, the flower. What's the next thing that has to happen to them? those flowers. Pollination. Pollination, you're right, absolutely. Okay, next. You guys peeked at my slides, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> so um, they bring in um, bumblebees and honeybees. Honeybees are more prevalent, um, but they're fussy. They don't like to work at night. They don't like to work when it's cold. Forget it if it's raining. <laughs> okay. Um, Bumblebees will work 24-7. You know, they're bigger, they're hardier. And each of these little flowers has to be pollinated at least seven times. So that's why they bring in extra bees, because the locals just aren't, there aren't enough of them. Um, and there's about, uh, let's say, one um, for each acre, or I'm, uh, yeah, each acre on the bog, there's probably two um, uh, hives that they bring in. Some of them come from Florida. Some of the growers actually keep their own bees. So, um, next one, pests. Yeah, there's a lovely thing here. Yeah. So, um, years and years ago, growers used a system called spray and pray. <laughs> which meant every, you know, every, you know, bi-weekly season, whatever, they would just throw all kinds of things on, on the, the, the plants. And they don't do that anymore. Uh, thank God we have the Cape Cod, the, the uh, UMass Cranberry Station in Wareham because they help uh, the growers. The growers go, uh, go out. They take nets. They see what's out there um, on their bog. They take about 20 or 30 cuttings from the plant, and they look at that little star-shaped area on the, on the berry and see if there's any larva on it or anything growing, any, any bugs eating anything down into the root. And they take it to the cranberry station um, in Wareham, uh, run by UMass, and it's a research arm for all of the growers. 
Uh, there's also Rutgers has one, which usually works with the growers more out in the Midwest and the West. And, um, and they decide if something, sometimes there's a pest out there and it hasn't formed enough to be any nuisance to the plants. So they're not gonna do anything about it. So they're very judicious and it's integrated pest management. They're very, very careful um, what they do. Uh, same thing with fertilizer. Because of the soil mixture of the, um, the, the cranberry bog, they don't need a lot of um, uh, fertilizer. And when they do, it's usually brought in you know, by a helicopter or, um, or, just, or the growers you know, find other ways to, to implement it. Next one. Yep. Okay. Yes, yeah, a little bit. So this is shows the they scoop up, you know, and see what's going on. They take magnifying glasses and look at everything. It's it's very scientific. Um, and again, the, some of the newer um, products, the newer uh, cranberry, uh, they're being uh, tested at the Cape Cod. Uh, at the UMass Cranberry Station, they're, they're growing them to ward off certain pests and also to ward off drought because that's, that's been an issue, especially not this past summer, but the summer before, we had a major drought uh, around here and uh, it, they had to actually use a lot of sprinklers to, to um, test and make sure that the plants were, were well, well fed. Next one. This is my favorite here. Um, and I'm sure if you've been out, you've seen the, the, the harvest or even when the plants, the, the bud the, with the cranberries are floating, it is just beautiful. And if you can get an aerial shot, it's, it's just spectacular because, um, you know, the, all the, the berries are, you know, they're all different parts color of red. Um, last year we had a lot more white berries because the, we didn't have those really cool nights to help get rid of the chlorophyll and just really turn them in deep red. Uh, this year it was much better, but you'll still see kind of a mosaic pattern uh, when they're floating. So what they do, uh, the growers do, they float, they, they, they flood the bogs through a, a series of flumes that they have and pumps. And uh, from a water source, it could be a river, a stream, a lake, a pond. Um, some growers actually share water uh, with one another. They flood the bog and the next day they come out and uh, those cute little berries, um, this has a little picture of them. No. Uh, those little berries have uh, little four little air pockets in them, so they float. But right here, they're probably, before this, they're still attached to the vine. So they take their water reels out and that reel just spins very carefully uh, across the water and it pops the berry off the vine. And if the wind is in your favor, <laughs> it will blow all those berries to one area. Sometimes that's not in your favor. So they have to corral those berries. Now they use uh, leaf blowers along the edges uh, to get any berries that didn't get into the corral and because they, they want to save every berry they can. Uh, but they put these poly booms and there's an outer boom and then there's an inner boom and they're about this thick and years and years ago they were wooden booms so of course they landed like this and there was a lot of leakage of berries. But now they're, you know, they're all um, poly uh, a substance and then there's usually four little spikes right here and that shows where the pump has come in so the, uh, the um, workers don't go and step into that and then they use roof rakes and most of us around here have had a roof rake if we want to get snow off of our roof so um, they use those roof rakes to help pull those berries toward the pump and they use that inner corral because it now compresses things and moves it faster. Okay, we can go to the next yep. slide. Okay, um, and once that, that pump, uh, you know, pumps the, the berries up into the truck, there are four or five spigots that wash the berries. They get washed as they go on the truck. All the water, there's holes at the bottom of the truck and then all the water goes back into the, the, um, <coughs> the, the, the berries where the the, pot, the bog is, and, um, and they, uh, they save about 85-90% of the water. Uh, there's a second truck that's next to the big, big truck that holds, those great big long trucks, holds about 40 to 50,000 pounds of berries. And there's a smaller truck that will get the debris because uh, squishy berries don't bounce. 
and the bouncing berries are the ones that are going to go into that truck. The squishy ones are going to go off to the side along with sticks, twigs, frogs, turtles, you name it, and they get them all back in the water. <laughs> Sometimes they make it to the receiving station, but they also take them back out to the ponds. Uh, we were on one tour where we had a lot of kids on this tour, and they had a turtle and a frog. And it, they had more fun with these. Well, at first I went to the turtle thinking, if that's a snapping turtle, I don't want that kid handling it. But it was a painted turtle, so it was safe. But that was a big hit for that day. Um, so uh, they go to the receiving station, and at the receiving station, it could be um, Ocean Spray, it could be Decus, it could be others. Some, some um, small, very small growers don't use a, a receiving station. They do all the work themselves and send it off to wherever they're going to be used. Now, this is the wet harvest. So the wet harvest is used for um, bear, uh uh, berries that are dried, also for uh, b juice, cranberry sauce, and any other product that you would that want to make. So they, from the receiving station, they're fro flash frozen, they're washed again, they're flash frozen, and they're sent off to whoever the manufacturer is. Um, about 96% of all um, cranberry bog um, harvest is wet. 4% is dry, it's a lot more labor intensive, but those are the berries that you're gonna buy in the supermarket or at a farm stand, okay? Um, so the fall frost protection, you have to be really careful because it is New England and um, the, bear, the, the season for harvest is mid-September to early November. And uh, last weekend was our last uh, tours that we did and uh, we were a little worried because it had been cold a couple of the nights, but not like this past week. Um, so they have to be careful, and they're going to either have to use the sprinkler systems or possibly flood the bog. But they don't want to keep the water because the cranberry doesn't like to be wet. So um, the roots and everything, so it needs to, to get that water out. The water after the harvest stays in uh, the bog for about a day or two to let all the nutrients settle back down. And then they either move that water onto another bog to harvest or they move it back into the water source. But they, they're very judicial in, in making sure they, they keep that water. Um, so um, the modern harvesting with the first mechanical harvester was developed in 1947. Um, and it represents uh, the, the dry is about 4% of the, um, the harvest. Now, years ago, um, go on to the, uh, the oh, yeah. So the dry harvest, they use helicopters um, after they finished harvesting the berries. And they, they put them in crates and they, they stack those crates up to three, which is about a thousand pounds. And the, they will move them off on, by helicopter onto either a truck or to a, a, another area. Next one. Now they developed for the hand picking, which really was hand picking um, before 1887. And that meant when the harvest was coming, it was all hands on deck. Kids got out of school, the grandparents got hoisted into this. It was a whole big family affair. Everybody went out picking berries. And you had, and I think this is where the term comes, stay in your lane, because they had strings and you had your own lane and you didn't go in anybody else's lane and you picked through that lane. Um, and it was very labor intensive and um, you know, it was child labor a little bit. So. Um, and then the rocker scoop after the snap scoop was invented to the rocker scoop was in the 1890s. And then that became a mechanical scoop, scoop over time and it almost looked like a snowblower. It would just go along and burlap bags would be on the back uh, to pull those berries in. Next one. Okay, and now the hand picking, once it was hand picked, it had to go someplace to be sorted. And they called it woman's work, okay? And all I can think of in the, in, in the hand sorting is remember uh, Lucy and Ethel uh, <laughs> with the chocolates? Yeah. Um, when it became more mechanical and those berries were going through and they had to pick out anything that wasn't perfect. Um, so this was very, very labor intensive. Um, I heard that if they, like, just, yeah. they got so good at it, they could just put their hand over it and they could just tell if they were good or bad. Yeah, amazing. 
Absolutely amazing. Okay, next one. So the wet harvest got developed in the 1960s. Thank God. <laughs> and um, it represents 96% uh, of the crops today. Um, and I mentioned before, they flood the bogs. Um, the berries float to the top. They're now um, moved by water reels, popped off the vines. Um, and they are ready for the harvest. Next one. And I mentioned the four little air pockets. I mean, this, this little berry was just perfect for this, this kind of work. They didn't have to do that dry harvesting if they'd only found a way to get some machinery. Okay, uh, next. So the machinery they have, the water reel, these are the um, flumes that open up to let the water in. The water reel is popping the berries off. And I can't see what that's a little, oh, on the side thing to push the berries in on the side. Next one. And the corralling of the fruit. And uh, there's flags on everybody's bogs. You probably see them when you drive around. Um, they're all different colors. Every grower uses a different color flag for different things. It might signify a low spot, a high spot, a rock, something that they want to watch. Um, uh, a, a, you know, an area of berries that they might want to watch. And one day I was out one of the, the harvests and one of these workers was pulling the boom in. He didn't notice there was a flag right near him. All of a sudden, he's underwater. <laughs> All you saw was his hat floating on top. And when you got waders on, you got to be careful you don't drown. <laughs> So um, actually somebody else decided they would tie a belt around the top of their, um, their uh, waders. And of course now there's an air pocket in here. And so when they got wet, they, they flipped over and they're kind of bouncing along on the water. <laughs> um, but they're really, they're a good group of people. They're really, they're a lot of fun to, to watch them do this. And here we have a truck that can hold 40 to 50,000 pounds of berries ready to, you know, when it gets finished, it's ready to move off to the uh, processing station. Next. And this is the receiving station. Uh, most, uh, some of them actually dump the berries into a great big pond of water to wash them and then pull them away from that. One of the ways that most of them around here use is they put the truck on a hydraulic lift. They open up the back and the berries go right in um, and they're washed again before they're processed. Okay. Now we get into some demographics. There are five major growing regions, um, and you can see they're all along that same uh, latitudinal area. Uh, New Jersey, Massachusetts, so I can go back one. Can you go back? <laughs> I just wake Chris up. Yeah. <laughs> Oregon, Washington, Wisconsin. Now, in 1996 or 7, I think, Wisconsin actually exceeded us. Yeah. They have newer bogs, and of course, they're more rectangular. Um, they have some more hybrid plants. They probably have about 95% hybrid plants. Next one. Um, and then Quebec has exceeded all of us because they have a lot of hybrid plants. Um, in 2014, they uh, exceeded us and Wisconsin, or is Wisconsin? on top again? It's hard to tell each year. Um, they doubled production in, in the last 10 years. They have a lot lower costs and they're um, more efficient, more hybrids. Um, and there's some in the Maritimes in Ontario and British Columbia. You can grow cranberries in Florida. You just can't get those cold nights that they need in the spring and the summer to form the berry. Okay. And these little dots represent where all the bogs are around here. So it's Cape Cod, Nantucket, um, Plymouth, uh, Rochester, Carver, uh, Wareham, Middleborough, Lakeville. And uh, there is uh, about 60,000 acres of upland surrounding these 13,000 acres of bogs. And uh, they make them very good stewards of the land because this upland can be streams, it can be forest, it can be fields. Um, I'm a birder, so when I'm out bird watching on our bogs, we go out, a team of us, and we pick up 40 to 50 different species of birds, um, especially in the springtime. Um, two of the fishing birds are the uh, bald eagle and the osprey that fish in the ponds around the bogs. It's so much fun to watch. 
Um, and there's deer and there's fisher cats and black bear is sort of making its way back into the area. Um, uh, coyotes, uh, koi wolves, you name it, yeah. Lots of uh, wildlife that is supported by this. And the bogs have very clean air. There's a lot of lichen on the trees, which signifies you know, a clean environment, clean air. Um, and it's just a great place to go and hang out. Okay. And I mentioned 60,000 acres of cranberry land um, and supported by three to four acres of upland and wetlands. Um, climate resilience, it's also a flood storage area. Uh, groundwater recharge and a lot of the wildlife habitat. <coughs> Next one. Okay. And the impact here. There's well over 1,900 jobs directly associated with cranberry farming. Um, there, it creates about 3,500 jobs in the processing and support industries and businesses. So it's about 6,300 jobs in Massachusetts. Um, it exceeds 1.7 billion in economic impact. And go to the next one. And just some names of some of the handling um, areas. Refresco, Dacus, Ocean Spray are some of the biggest. Ocean Spray also um, has about 600 growers overall, uh, many of them out in the West and the Midwest. Okay. And tourism, or we call it kind of ecotourism. Uh, there's a, a couple of uh, folks that they're young and they've uh, taken over some cranberry bogs, they bought them, and they've turned them into a great a tourist area, farm stands, they put people in waders and stick them in their bog and talk to them about the cranberries. And, um, and they also you know, do a harvest as well. Uh, and, the, and because the average age of the grower in Massachusetts is 55 years old, and they're multi-generational, so um, it's difficult to get some of the younger kids to take over the business. And um, so it's nice to see newbies coming in. And uh, well, on the Cape, uh, a young couple bought a bog, didn't know anything about it. And the person that sold it to them said he would stick with them, help them out. And, uh, and did, and then all the other growers, uh, they all help each other out. They're just wonderful people, okay? So I mentioned uh, over 300 growers in Massachusetts, multi-generational. 70% um, of the farms are 15 to 20 acres. Uh, AD Makepeace is the largest. It also owns, has the largest bog. Um, in, the in the country, in the world, I think. Um, they all have those traditional peat bogs. And um, next one. So some of the challenges that uh, our growers face, urbanization, everybody wants to build a house someplace and land is becoming uh, quite a premium to build. Uh, there's competition for water resources, uh, the lack of ag agricultural literacy in the state. Um, the high cost of production here and um, due to taxes, labor and land cost, uh, we have one of the highest tax states uh, for businesses and it's hard to attract workers because it is very hard work. Um, many natural pests and a, a need for a lot more research and climate change is, is playing a role in this too. Next one. And to contrast the shapes, these are the Massachusetts bogs, and this is Canada. Not as pretty as ours. No. <laughs> okay. So we follow wherever that natural wetland system um, was from the beginning, either b because they were farmed of the bog iron or the glaciers um, set those areas. And uh, historical data, it shows that Wisconsin is actually the largest growing in the region today. And that's in the green up here. So at least we're keeping it in the states. And next one. And this is the barrels. Um, Wisconsin took over first place in 96. 95% high yield uh, with newer varieties. And Massachusetts is the red line. It's up and down, but it's pretty steady. Uh, and Quebec is 100% newer variants, so a double and triple the yield that we would have here. Also, their labor costs are less, their taxes are less. Okay. Uh, Massachusetts exports about 
50% of its, uh, its berries, uh, mostly to Europe, and that's because we're you know, close to the ports. And, um, but overall, in, uh, in, the in the United States, we probably do about 40% export. <laughs> uh, berries are becoming very important to other countries. Uh, the one that's really jumped out recently is India. They've found a way to mix their spices with the berries, and they really like this. Um, and a lot of these countries are finding that the um, medicinal um, uh, needs of the berry is just so important to them too. It is a super fruit, it's a pack fruit, um, and it's a non-GMO fruit. Okay. Um, so it's uh, helped with urinary tract infections. It won't prevent them, but it's, I mean, it won't cure them, but it will help prevent them. Um, it's cancer preventing qualities. It's good for your gut health. It's good for your gums. Uh, Anti-aging, uh, heart disease, ulcer, ulcer prevention. Um, so it's, it's, really, uh, it's really good. You can back a second. It, it's very low in sugar. It's tart. When you go to the store, you'll see lots of varieties of cranberry juice, but try to look for a juice um, that has at least 27% cranberries in it, because a lot of them mix apple, grape, pomegranate, you know, a lot of other groups, uh, things to sweeten it up. Um, try to look for lower sugar content. I think Langer's sells one that's actually total cranberry juice. It's a little tart, but it's, it's good. It's good for you. Okay, next one. Um, so the equivalents, if you want to know what's in your cranberry sauce, um, you've got uh, a half cup of, um, of cranberries goes into that. Dried, um, one ounce sweetened. Um, fresh is 1% cup of fresh fruit and juice is 10 to 27% and now even up to 100%. Okay, next one. And this is how to reach us, uh, cranberries.org, uh, to get other recipes, um, find out about the tours that we do. Uh, they're a lot of fun. They're on weekends out of Carver. Um, Dick Ward has um, offered his, um, his bog as a starting and ending point. He's even put a little museum in, and he's always there to talk with, um, with the people that come out on the tours. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We go out on school buses and we find the, the harvest going on. We never know till the day we get there, do we, where we're going to go. <laughs> and um, now questions, anyone? Just any questions for Deb? I just yes. wanted to know if you want to go on a tour, when do they happen and where do you find them? They happen um, in uh, late September to early November. Earlier the better because it gets kind of cool toward the end. Um, and it's at cranberries.org. Okay. Yeah, the Gr Growers Association, the one that sponsored these. Yes? And I just want to give a plug to the Make Peace shop. And they have the absolute best cranberry vinaigrette. I go up there and buy like five bucks. Where is that? Send them to people. Yeah, the, the Make, make Peace. Cranberry, yeah. And the cranberry mustard. I'm now sending to my girlfriend in Virginia after we've tasted it last year. So. Yeah, we sell that after the tours too. Yeah. yeah. They haven't started selling my mojito yet though. <laughs> Yeah. 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 It's yeah. Make Peace Farms is on uh, Tahonet Road in Wareham, yeah. off of uh, Route 28, yeah. the Cranberry Highway. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a very small sign. Yeah, but you know, put them on your GPS. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is it open year round? No, um, it's going to be closing around before Thanksgiving. It's open Tuesday to Saturday, 10 to 3, and they have great food there. Great sandwiches, great soups. Yep, and they sell a lot of cranberry scones and bread and muffins. Where's that again? Yes, that's Make Peace Farms. Yeah. So if you buy a package of cranberries, yeah. should you wash them? You talked about them being washed a couple of times. Do you wash them? Yourself. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. If you buy fresh cranberries, do you wash them? Yes, if you're going to use them within a day or two, because after that they will start to deteriorate. If you are not going to use them, or you're going to use just some of them, don't wash them. Put them in a, a baggie, a freeze, freezer baggie. Get all the air out you can. Freeze them up to three years. I'm still pulling some out from last year. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, they last a long time. Um, Dick Ward said he put some fresh berries down in his basement. Um, it's cool down there, and um, they stay that way all, all winter long to the spring. 
Yeah, yeah, that you wash them before you use them. Okay. Yeah. Can't hurt. The other yeah. thing is to chop them up if you want little pieces. Yeah. Good idea. Chop them up, and but they they might get a little wet too, and freeze them that way if you want just pieces. Yeah. Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you. Thank you.